I'd like to introduce Wayne Stewart, the director of the Northern California HIV AIDS Policy Research Center and Robert Gamboa, senior policy advocate and community organizer at the Los Angeles LGBT Center uh, who will review the agenda and objectives for the day. So I wanna welcome everyone. As Craig mentioned, I'm Wayne Stewart. I'm a professor at UCSF and currently the academic principal investigator for the Northern California HIV AIDS Research Program. Um, we are one of two research, research centers um, in the state that focus on HIV policy. Um, our center is a collaboration between UCSF and the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. And then our collaborators in Southern California at their center include UCLA, uh, APLA Health, and the LA LGBT Center. And um, we will be, uh, the, the two centers have um, been renewed for additional cycle of funding that will start up in the in early in 2021 and our partnerships will be expanding at that time. So we we'll look forward to telling you about that in a few months. Um, so the policy research centers, many of you have interacted with us before. Um, we're funded to ensure that HIV decision-making in the state um, can be informed by, by policy research in some way. And so um, we conduct rapid research rapid projects that try to address emerging issues in the policy environment. And as part of that, we regularly sponsor meetings that help us to understand what is going on in terms of the priorities that and issues that all of you are facing so that we can think about the, the, the work that we will be doing going forward. And so part of what we'll be doing today is listening to understand what kinds of issues you're facing so that we can um, think about where our rapid response research will be taking us in the near future. And so I wanna now hand it over to Robert who will tell you a little bit about the Ending the Epidemics uh, group, uh, which is also sponsoring this. Thanks so much, Wayne. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, I get the great pleasure of sharing a little bit about Ending the Epidemics. So the Ending the Epidemics is a statewide coalition of community-based organizations, health departments, and individuals who are committed and determined in ending the syndemic of HIV, hepatitis C, and sexually transmitted diseases in California. Together, we advocate for anti-racist policies and funding priorities to eliminate health inequities among people of African descent who identify as African American or Black, Latino, Latina, or Latinx, indigenous populations and all people of color. Um, the ETE has been around for a few years and has done some pretty impressive work in policy advocacy and community organizing, including fighting to procure state funding, working with state policymakers to champion legislation and building a powerful coalition of close to 200 organizations from all across the state, all in a focused effort to end these epidemics in California. I think that's pretty impressive. And given the great challenges of 2020, one of the positive outcomes is that we had to take a good long hard look at ourselves and ask ourselves if we are truly responding to these epidemics in a way that meets the needs of our black, brown and indigenous community members. We spent many hours and many meetings <laughs> grounding ourselves in racial justice and under the great leadership of Dr. Demisha Burns and David Boudivon this summer, we, re we reframe all of our motives and intentions to center our work around racial justice. This meant creating the right infrastructure and mission to better meet the needs and meet the moment of responding to and addressing these systems of oppression and institutionalized racism that we can work that so that we can work towards removing all racial and systemic barriers in hopes of truly actualizing an end to these epidemics. <clears throat> So um, given that the purpose of today's session will help the ETE and the policy research centers by giving us great insight and direction as we focus on any of these epidemics in California. Um, our objectives today are threefold. First, uh, our first objective is to better understand the current state and federal uh, political landscape following the 2020 elections. And then given that information, we will then discuss challenges to maintaining and improving HIV, HCV, STD and harm reduction services in California during the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, we aim to identify priorities in improving services for these epidemics and harm reduction efforts in California, given the stark reality of our current economic and political reality. And I'll turn it back to Wayne. Great, thank you. And let me just note that Ryan Clary noted in the chat that if you're interested in, in the epidemics, there's a link he's provided to join it. So uh, you can scroll through the chat to find that there. Um, I did wanna take this moment to introduce Tyler Martz, who's the project officer for the 
for the two policy centers. And, and she is with the California HIV AIDS Research Program, which is within the University of California Office of the President. And CHRP not only um, funds our center, but actually provided the, a lot of the initial funding for the, the initial meetings that helped to launch the End the Epidemics initiative statewide. So Tyler? Yes, hi. Um, I, as Wayne mentioned, um, the California HIV AIDS Research Program is, is really proud of the work, of supporting the work of the policy research centers and um, the initial kickoff of ending the epidemics. And we just wanted to offer our, our welcome uh, to this meeting. I'm thrilled to see how many participants are here. Um, and we're really looking forward to the discussion and the presentation. So um, thank you so much for your continued involvement. And um, we really appreciate you being here to contribute to, to this really important work. Thank you, Tyler. And Robert, I will hand it back over to you for the agenda. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Wayne. So just a, a brief overview of today's agenda. Um, it's going to be an exciting one as we begin with a fantastic keynote speaker that Craig will introduce us here in a moment. And then we will dive into the state and federal landscape overview with Courtney Mul uh, Mulhern Pearson from the San Francisco AIDS Foundation and Jenna Haywood from the Harm Reduction Coalition. We will then break out into smaller sessions to discuss what we've heard thus far and focusing on what is possible. Um, then Ayako Miyashita Ochoa will, from the Southern California HIV AIDS Policy Research Center will bring us back together for a larger group discussion to collect our thoughts and ideas on how to move forward. And finally, Dr. Demisha Burns from World and Craig Pulsifer from APLA Health will close us out. Craig? Great. Thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, so I think I saw our keynote speaker just joined. Is that right? Are you here, Sandra Wiener? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Well, I'll um, do a quick introduction. So I'm sure many folks on the call know uh, Senator Wiener, his longtime support of CHRP, CHPRC and the End the Epidemics effort. So just a quick bio for folks who don't know him. Senator Wiener was elected to the Senate in November 2016 and was just reelected this year. Uh, so congrats on that. Um, he currently serves as chair of the Senate Housing Committee and the LGBTQ caucus. And I'm sure many folks are familiar with bills that he's authored around HIV and other uh, important issues, including reforming California's HIV criminal laws, allowing pharmacists to furnish PrEP and PEP. And this year introduced a bill to require the state to develop a master plan on HIV, hepatitis C and STDs, uh, which had to be postponed because of COVID-19. So Senator Wiener, we very grateful for you for us to join us today. Um, so I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Craig. And thanks for always working with us um, on many, many issues, including ones we drag you into. <laughs> That's my MO, dragging advocates into uh, bills saying, will you please work with us on this bill? Um, uh, anyway, uh, I hope everyone is uh, doing well. And thank you all for your work. When I look around uh, Zoom, uh, just uh, a complete treasure trove of experience and expertise um, in around HIV and STIs and public health in general. And as we, you know, uh, as we go through this horrific uh, pandemic, um, yet another pandemic, and one that actually is affecting um, uh, a much broader swath of society than uh, than the HIV pandemic. So it's getting, imagine that, a vaccine potentially in less than a year. Um, wish we had had that kind of focus in the 1980s on, on HIV, but it's a, it's a learning moment in many ways um, about what we can do as a society when we actually focus on a public health uh, problem. Um, we, we can do a lot and we can do it a lot faster than people sometimes uh, think. Um, and we also, I think, have learned this pandemic, which I think a lot of us knew already, um, that this country's public health infrastructure is sort of a mess. Um, and although there are some bright spots, like in San Francisco and, uh, and in uh, LA, and where we have more of a commitment uh, to public health, and so we have more infrastructure, sometimes because of the HIV uh, pandemic, um, you know, overall, it's just, it, this has shown, I mean, it's shown every flaw and inequity in society and education, healthcare, housing, everything else. Uh, but we see it in our public health system. And the fact that we continue, we're in November, 
and we continue to struggle to get people like easy access to testing. There are other countries where you just walk down the street and you get a test and boom, it's easy and it's fast. And we still find a way, even in California, to make it really clunky and difficult for people to get a test where people just throw their hands up and say, why should I even bother? And so the, it's really, I think, been a massive reminder of the need to rebuild public health infrastructure uh, in this country, uh, whether it's for HIV and STIs, for whatever the next uh, respiratory uh, illnesses that comes upon us, uh, and for other uh, health needs. And so I'm hoping that as we come out of this, especially if uh, things go uh, a certain way in Georgia, um, maybe even in the next couple of years, we can uh, see some big budget moves federally uh, to support states and cities building out uh, that infrastructure so that we can do a lot of testing and contact tracing and other supports, not just for COVID, but for many other uh, communicable um, uh, diseases. So um, as, as Craig mentioned, this year we, we started out thinking really big. We're gonna, um, we're gonna you know, introduce, we introduced legislation on ending the epidemics and we made a, put together, I think a $50 million budget ask if I recall the number of 52 million. Um, and we were gonna you know, fight really hard to um, get California to commit to moving the dial um, on uh, HIV and STIs. And of course the pandemic then hit and the bottom fell out of the budget. And so we had to set that aside. And even though you may have read that um, uh, revenue uh, is actually coming in higher than, than we anticipated, it's still way lower than obviously it was before. Um, and that money, I think a lot of it, you know, there's gonna be a lot of claims on that, including reversing cuts to education and some, uh, you know, uh, safety net services. So I'm not overly optimistic that we're gonna have all this excess money that we can um, tap into for things like ending the epidemics. But I do think we should um, definitely be prepared for next year. Um, and I know I wanna thank the coalition after the pandemic hit and we said, let's have a plan B, C, D and E. <laughs> um, so we can go down from that 50 million down to like you know a few million. And although we ended up not getting any of it um, because of how dire the situation was, um, I do think it's worth pursuing a more limited um, approach next year to try to you know, build a foundation and keep momentum going so that as we come out of this, we can make this a priority that this um, investment can grow over time as we recover uh, from the economic uh, collapse relating to the pandemic. Um, so that is something that I, we need to, I think, keep uh, working on. Um, we also uh, need to, I think, really keep um, focusing on uh, equity and healthcare, um, which, you know, once again, the pandemic, uh, every, a lot of people were surprised as well. You know, black people are dying at outrageous, you know, numbers or, you know, uh, or Latinx uh, infection rates are dramatically higher. And it was like all surprising for a lot of people, but anyone working in public health was not surprised in terms of um, the way that we treat marginalized communities in the healthcare system uh, and as a matter of public health in this country. Um, and so when we look at the work that we do, for example, around HIV and communities of color or the trans community, I think it's a, you know, it, it, it helps us make the case for the state to focus on uh, these uh, inequities um, and to end uh, these inequities, not just to assume that because, you know, Castro or West Hollywood might be doing okay with HIV. That doesn't mean that that you know other areas are are doing well. And so you know, doing more work in the Central Valley and Inland Empire and places that don't have the same level of infrastructure. Um, I know Courtney and Craig have heard me talk about this before. The fact that it's still hard to get an HIV test in a large majority of California. Um, uh, is outrageous. Uh, and so those kinds of investments as well, making better use of our pharmacies, which we did with um, SP-159, where we were able to authorize pharmacists to provide PrEP and PEP without a physician prescription, uh, because pharmacies are, uh, you know, they're in the communities. People, you know, are, I think really know their pharmacists. Um, we should be using our pharmacies for a lot of things that we're not in terms of testing and, uh, and so forth. Um, we also, um, we're gonna, we're, we're working um, next year 
Uh, we introduced it this year. We had to pull back with COVID. Um, the, we want to make sure that we're expanding um, rapid syphilis tests um, to make sure that uh, when you go to an HIV counselor and you're getting tested for everything else, you get a rapid syphilis test uh, as well. Uh, and then we're doing a lot of harm reduction work um, around uh, uh, substance use disorder, uh, including our safe consumption site uh, legalization bill and doing some more work, work around um, meth and other contingency management. So there's a lot of work that we're going to do next year. And I think there is a potential for some budget work, although that is very much hit and miss. And, and I know um, the Department of Finance and the governor, are they're gonna respond, yes, we got some extra money, more money than we thought this year, but that's, we have, that's gonna be made up for with future losses. And so we have to reserve it. Um, so I'm not overly optimistic on that front. Um, but th those are sort of that's my take on what's happening. Um, and I'm just praying that um, you know, now that we figured out how to conduct business as a legislature during a pandemic, um, that we can come back and have a much smoother ride next year in terms of our legislative process. So again, thank you for all your work. Yeah, thank you, Senator Weiner. I know you um, have a busy day today, so thanks for making time to join us. Um, and yeah, thanks for your you know continued support of the work that we do. And I know everyone was grateful to hear from you today, so appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much, and I'll, for everyone, never hesitate to reach out to my uh, to office my office for anything. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So next we uh, have a presentation from Courtney Mulhern Pearson, the Vice President of Policy at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, and Jenna Haywood, the Associate Director of Community Mobilization at Harm Reduction Coalition. And they're going to provide an overview of the federal and state political landscape, uh, which should be really helpful before we move into the breakout group portion of the agenda. Um, okay, well, uh, thank you. I think uh, Senator Weiner and Robert kind of scooped a lot of our presentation, but we'll um, um, push through and hopefully have a, a few extra minutes for questions. So we just wanted to um, offer sort of a big picture overview of where we are um, within the current political landscape. When we developed this agenda, it was pre before the federal election. So um, happy that we're on the other side of that and we can have a slightly uh, better picture of, um, of what we'll be facing in 2021 and beyond. Uh, so wanted to start with some of the good news. So we have made some recent advancements in HIV, H uh, hepatitis C, STDs, and harm reduction, um, starting with, or we'll start with the End the Epidemics Community Consensus Statement. So we came together, as you heard earlier, um, as a group of different um, came together, bringing together different disease areas and focuses to try to have um, a better uh, syndemics approach to, to these three areas and really four areas, recognizing that um, the break, you know, breaking them out was kind of an artificial way to look at, at these issues and that for people's lives, it doesn't make sense to break out issue areas like we have. Um, so really wanted to come together to create, um, push the state to take a syndemics approach to, um, to ending these epidemics. Um, we used the gubernatorial election in 2018 as our way to try to get some political buy-in. And um, then gubernatorial candidate Newsom did actually endorse our in the epidemics um, proposal and our community consensus statement, although we've still are um, get him to realize that. Um, that promise. There's also been some um, action at the federal center of uh, federal level, excuse me. Um, specifically on the HIV, there's the end the HIV epidemics um, plan, there's a viral hepatitis elimination plan and an STD plan. Um, although we have yet to see, well, I guess there's some states now that are looking at this endemic approach, but we have yet to see um, any state or federal um, government take a syndemic approach like we have. Um, and there with the, specifically with the end the HIV epidemics plan, there has been significant increase in federal funding for HIV prevention and treatment. Um, some of which has come to the state and some of which has come to the, I think it's eight identified counties in California um, that met the criteria for um, that the uh, federal government had set. Jenna, do you wanna 
Sure. Um, and then as Senator Weiner mentioned, um, while and the Epidemics Coalition was not able to get the 52 uh, million, the state did um, did uh, include 15 million um, in in funding for HIV, HCV, and STD prevention, um, which uh, came in last year, and then this year it was made ongoing, which was a victory, even though it isn't it isn't enough. Um, the ongoing means that there is um, a lot more security in that money moving forward. Um, and then this past year, uh, uh, in collaboration with um, all of the syringe exchange programs across the state and allies, um, the state allotted $15 million in funding for harm reduction staffing, which is the, um, the most money that California has ever invested in harm reduction services in the history of California. So it was a huge victory and will go a long way toward making sure that syringe access programs um, have adequate staff to meet the needs of their community. Um, and then AB 2077 was passed and will go into effect in January. It, it's an extension of an existing bill that allows for pharmacy access without a prescription of syringes. Um, but it also goes a step further and actually makes um, all syringe possession legal, which um, is really important because uh, you know, we know that people who use drugs are, even with this law, people who use drugs are still being cited and arrested for uh, syringe possession, which means that they are less likely to be able to um, use a new syringe for every injection, which is what, you know, we want them to be able to do. So this law with the right implementation will, um, will protect people who use drugs from getting harassed and having to also, um, dispose of their syringes in, in uh, a way that isn't um, in line with best practices. Um, and so this is sort of a victory and a challenge to point out. Um, the victory here is that you can see in this map that um, that syringe access in California has, so now there's, there's funding for staff, which is great, but there's also been an expansion of programs in the last several years reaching to, I think actually there's now 60 programs across the state. Um, and many of those programs have expanded into new counties, into rural areas of the state. You can see all the orange and the green on the map represent um, new programs since 2016. And they, those are all you know, beyond the coast. So these are areas that historically did not have access to services at all. Um, and California is lucky to have the syringe uh, clearinghouse, which provides um, supplies. It's a state fund that su uh, provides supplies to programs. But one thing that we have seen with this increase in programs that has also come along with an increase in demand um, and more syringes going out than ever before. And Courtney will talk more about um, challenges specific to COVID-19, but we know that we've seen more of a demand since COVID um, and, um, and that COVID has really impacted all of the services. Um, but so even though there is the supply clearinghouse, which is wonderful, um, the amount of money has been set at $3 million since 2016 or 2015. And so while uh, the growth has not, uh, the, um, the amount of money has not kept pace with demand. And um, we were not able to uh, successfully get money added to that last year, um, though we tried, the, and the Epidemics Coalition tried. Um, and so, yeah, the other thing is, um, you know, we, we also, there are areas that don't have a program and because the clearinghouse supply budget is maxed out, um, you know, no new programs will have any access to that fund. So it, it's already stretched with the existing programs and it means that counties that may need it will not be able to. Um, and then a political barrier to, you know, existing harm reduction services and certainly to the expansion of harm reduction services um, has to do with growing opposition or maybe more visible opposition. I, I think there always has been some, but as it's become more pervasive throughout the state, we've seen some organized and, and somewhat effective opposition. Um, and so, and, you know, during COVID, this is adding an extra challenge, an extra stressor on programs to have to deal with Honestly, you know, some uh, community members and some local government um, elected officials challenging what has been uh, 
you know, evidence that has, we should not even be having a conversation about in 2020 in terms of the efficacy of syringe access as important for HIV prevention and hepatitis C prevention. Um, and so we've seen a few lawsuits that have um, shut down programs in some of these rural communities and other legal challenges like local um, ordinances that ban syringe access. And so even though technically um, because of the state uh, law that can certify um, the state certification process should supersede these county bans, but we're still seeing um, that these challenges are either having a, a chilling effect where programs don't wanna start because of all of the harassment really that they're facing um, or they're, they're shutting down um, based on a few lawsuits. So that is something we know going into the next year that is gonna have to be looked at. And, and, um, and you know one other point on that is that a new report that just came out from CDPH that shows both the rates of hepatitis C and overdose in California, as well as vulnerability to HIV outbreaks, um, show uh, that some of the counties that are facing the most opposition are the same counties that are actually most at risk to having a really severe HIV outbreak already um, are counties that have high overdose rates and um, high hepatitis C rates among injection drug users specifically. Um, and so continuing on that, as Jenna mentioned, and as you heard from Senator Weiner, um, COVID-19 has complicated things and also made um, clear a lot of the existing challenges that we were all um, pretty aware of, but I guess made more publicly clear. Um, so due to COVID-19, I think as Senator Weiner mentioned, the legislature was required to limit, limit bills due to their shortened session. And so bills were really only supposed to make it through if they focused on COVID homelessness or wildfires. Um, so a number of the legislative um, uh, actions that we were working on last year were halted. Um, the state is also pay facing, um, this number is now out of date as of today, but a $54 billion budget shortfall. I think it actually looks a little bit better than that for the short term, but as Senator Weiner mentioned, longer term, we're seeing pretty staggering deficits. So um, uh, getting new funding will be likely challenging. Um, we've also seen a lot of challenges due to public health staff being reassigned to COVID-19, um, which has stretched thin and already stretched workforce um, and led to delays in things like getting some of the funding that we were able to successfully get in the budget, um, took a really long time to get it all distributed. Um, we've also seen very significant disruptions to prevention, testing, and treatment services. Um, that were you know, completely stopped at the very beginning of the crisis and now have been kind of slowly restarted, but not at the level, um, at least in San Francisco, that we were seeing before COVID-19. Um, plus all of the widespread um, unemployment, housing instability, substance use, mental health, um, all of the other crises that are kind of overly, overlying um, the existing issues that we were dealing with. Um, and as uh, has been mentioned, um, COVID-19 has really put a spotlight on the health disparities that were already existing. Um, and I think, you know, really laid bare the gaps in racism in our system. Um, and briefly, just on the 2020 election, um, you know, the Biden was elected, but will likely face a divided government. I think Senator Weiner was a little bit more optimistic, I feel a little anxious about the Georgia elections, but um, you know, whatever happens, it's, it will likely be harder for them to get things through Congress. Um, based on the recent Supreme Court um, hearing that does seem like the justices are at least leaning towards keeping the ACA intact, um, but big improvements or large system overhauls seem unlikely, particularly given the divided government. Um, Obviously, or I guess not obviously, uh, we feel like the Biden administration will be uh, slightly better or much better on LGBT rights, that immigration, criminal justice. Um, and they have promised an end the epidemic's plan, HIV epidemic to end the HIV epidemic by 2025. Um, but obviously COVID is gonna be sucking up all existing public health focus for the foreseeable future. Sorry, they're singing in the background, my kids. <laughs> um, and then federal uh, COVID-19 relief bill is really critical. A lot of our state and local government budgets are depending on, um, 
are sort of balanced on the assumption that that Congress will allocate some funding. Um, but again, this is looking less likely in the um, in this session and um, likely not to be the, the levels that we really need. Um, and, you know, again, in California, we do have a Democratic major majority controlled legislature, which tends to be um, more friendly towards our issues and to our budget requests, but the significant deficit is going to make things challenging for us from a budget perspective. Um, so just a little bit about looking ahead. I think I've covered some of this already, but as Robert mentioned, um, and the epidemics did take this COVID period to really restructure and renew our focus on prioritizing racial justice. Um, so that means both a new formal structure um, with a real intention on centering black and brown leadership um, and a commitment to dismantling systemic racism in public health and really holding ourselves accountable through our racial justice um, working group, but also through all of the committees um, in, in the epidemics. Um, we really need, we're looking for this meeting to help us come together to identify priorities so that we can maintain the progress that we've made on HIV, HTV, STDs, and harm reduction. Um, and, you know, taking into account the new economic and political reality. Um, we, we anticipate that um, state revenue, securing state revenue will be likely difficult, um, but we know there's other things we can do through legislation and administrative, administrative advocacy, um, but also, you know, we'll likely want to push forward for some limited budget request, I guess, to just make sure that we're maintaining our presence and the focus on the issues that, that we care about. Um, so we're hoping to take the meeting today to, um, really discuss the challenges and, um, and identify priorities. And then um, we will share the meeting summary with all of you and also with key stakeholders, which include state leadership um, so that we can help um, influence the policy priorities. I think I have three minutes in case there's any questions. Yeah, about three minutes. So uh, if anyone has questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. Looks like we have a question there. Jim Banta, Banta says, how do we handle grassroots outreach during COVID? Grassroots advocacy outreach or, um, or client outreach? Um, I don't know if Andy's on the call, if you want to talk about any of the grassroots advocacy outreach that you've been able to do during COVID. Hi, yeah, so my name's Andy, um, and I am Senior Community uh, Mobilization Manager with the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Um, and I'll say particularly, I think, related to the End the Epidemics campaign, um, we've recently just created a new uh, committee that's going to deal with grassroots engagement and outreach to the grassroots activists and advocates. Um, and so part of the conversations that we're going to have moving forward are um, what, you know, uh, folks think would be the most helpful in terms of engaging the grassroots and what does it look like to um, kind of plug people into strategic uh, actions that align with our, you know, our statewide strategy. Um, so definitely get plugged into that conversation if you're interested. Um, you can join our uh, committee. I'm not sure if Ryan is on and can share the link to sign up, um, but that's one way to kind of get plugged in. Um, we've done a lot of different stuff, uh, social media outreach and engagement. Uh, we've done, you know, petitions uh, to try to push the governor and state legislators around uh, creating a strategic uh, statewide plan. Um, and I, I imagine what we're going to talk about in that committee is kind of expanding on that work. Great, thanks, Andy. And, um, yeah, thank you, Courtney and Jenna. Um, I, I see there's a few more questions in the chat, so maybe we can answer those through the chat. I saw, Marsha, you asked about data on impact on re service reductions during COVID, and uh, CHPRC did do an organizational health survey, I think it was um, in May, looking at impact on organizations and services. So uh, maybe someone can share that survey in the chat, and we have had conversations about potentially, you know, doing a similar survey um, now that things are starting to get, you know, up and running a little bit more. 
Um, but just wanna move into the next portion of the agenda, which is the breakout group. So uh, this is the really key piece of our meeting today is just hearing from all of you uh, about your challenges and priorities. Uh, before we move into the breakout groups, Nina, would you mind just sharing the poll results so everyone can see who's on the call today? Uh, it looks like the majority of folks are administrators, but then we have a number of consumer and policy advocates, uh, analysts and researchers and some providers as well. Uh, next question. Um, so your affiliation, it looks like uh, nonprofit organizations, a majority and lots of government folks as well. Um, over half are focused on HIV, but quite a number focused on the other areas as well. Um, and then in terms of state representation, we have about a quarter um, that have a statewide focus, a quarter from LA, about 20% from the Bay Area, uh, and then folks spread out from across the state as well. So a good representation here. So again, thanks everyone for joining. We're gonna divide into breakout groups now. So uh, in a few seconds, everyone will be sent to a breakout group um, we'll, where you'll be talking about challenges and priorities. The breakout groups will be about 50 minutes and then we'll come back uh, for a group discussion. So see you all on the other side. Okay, thank you to everyone who participated in breakout rooms. Um, I have the unenviable task now of trying to give you a global view of what I was seeing take, ha uh, take shape, conversations that were happening in the breakout rooms. Um, I didn't enter any breakout rooms, but uh, I was hovering over them by looking at your notes. So groups that took notes along the way, thank you so much. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Ayako Miyashita Ochoa. I am the Associate Director for the Southern California um, HIV AIDS Policy Research Center, also at UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs, along with my colleague Ian Holloway. Um, so pleased to be here and really excited to sort of share with you what I was seeing um, in, in the various conversations that were happening in breakout rooms. Uh, so I'm gonna just sort of give some uh, overview from a, from a global perspective of the kinds of things that um, I was reading about from your, each of your groups. And then I'm gonna invite facilitators and, and note takers to share any additional, um, any additional ideas or notes that didn't really uh, rise to the surface in the same way. So um, let me go ahead and just share with you what I saw, uh, particularly as it relates to challenges first. So the first thing that I want to note is that, you know, across the board, folks are noting just how much the COVID pandemic has impacted services and staffing. And so one of the things that just kept popping up was redeploy, redeployment, people just being reassigned to um, address uh, the, the COVID pandemic and sort of leaving their other work behind and how that has had uh, such an impact on services. So that's definitely, um, um, sort of a, a key theme running through uh, all these groups, you know, talking about uh, service disruption. I will say that there were a fair number of groups that talked about telehealth. Um, you know, I think this is a really um, important point. Um, while some folks were talking about how telehealth has really bridged the gap, uh, in meeting the needs of, of their clients and their patients. Um, some folks were really clear that telehealth was not, you know, not a, uh, a solution for everybody. And that in fact, the digital divide is still so alive and well in that telehealth does not solve problems for, for all the people that uh, really need to be served in this moment. Um, the next trend or, or, or theme I saw running through a lot of groups is really about testing and screening and how the, the, the rates for testing and screening have gone down. Um, and the call, um, which was, was uh, uh, again, across the board made by uh, quite a few groups was about how we need to rethink testing. And that in fact, you know, the way we have reshaped testing for COVID gives us some opportunities to think about how we might reshape testing for HIV, for HCV, and for uh, STIs. And so um, I'm just going to put testing out there as one of the challenges that was raised, but also um, will be something we'll talk about when we talk about priorities. Um, there was a lot of, uh, I think, of uh, fear 
um, and and not unfounded, right? That there's been loss to care, that folks without having the face-to-face -face interaction um, with uh, their patients and their clients, that they're that they're losing contacts with them. So I think this is a really critical piece of, of piece of losing sort of um, what some folks identified as low barrier um, services or the, the, just the ability for people to walk in to uh, a brick and mortar shop to access services, that losing that in, in light of what's happening with this pandemic um, has created some real problems. Um, staffing freezes, uh, again, sort of connected to the whole redeployment issue, but also the inability to, to staff up and really actually address also the many barriers that staff are, are, are faced with, right? Um, we are all humans. We are all within the same communities and we're all being impacted in different ways by the pandemic. And so that was something that really um, a number of groups really talked about is, you know, how do we make sure that the people that are taking care of people um, uh, can continue to do that particular task. As it relates to um, hepatitis C, there were some really clear directions in terms of the types of uh, barriers that people were facing. Um, one of them is about really funding and funding for the clearinghouse, um, funding for services and prioritizing, you know, HCV uh, testing and syringe uh, access services. Um, obviously, there are pockets uh, throughout California where syringe access is still a big problem. Uh, and so that was really noted um, in, in a couple of different groups. There's a, a really a desire to, to sort of look at, and again, this will come up in priorities, um, but ways in which we can reduce barriers to accessing, testing, and treatment. And so to the extent that all those things can happen, um, looking at this from a syndemic point of, point of view um, was something that, that did pop up quite a few times. So that's sort of a global look at the challenges. Um, I wanna invite any facilitators and note takers that have any additional sort of um, gloss to this, uh, things that I might've missed in my review, but that, but that were brought up in your groups, please, please feel free to share. Ayako, okay. I'll, just, I'll just note that, um, I mean, you, 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 touched on the, um, you touched on the issue of kind of people being stretched then, but we actually had a pretty extensive discussion in our group about the way that the, you know, the fact that so many health department officials are activated for COVID and the kind of spill that that ends up having down to the agencies. One, one of our participants is a provider who's new to the state. It took months to get credentialed just to be able to provide care. And so there just really is this issue of how do you continue to focus on all the other things that need to be focused on when all of a sudden you have this gigantic extra pandemic that you're trying to deal with. And really we're just not staffed in our, in our public health infrastructure to deal with something for that extended period of time like it's been. Thank you for that. Absolutely. That was definitely spelled out um, in the notes in terms of, you know, the ways in which that reshifting, that redeployment or the inability to staff up impacts everything else. Um, there was a really sort of um, deep thread within that that just talked about how, you know, HIV, uh, hepatitis C services, harm reduction services are really taking back burner. Uh, to COVID and the ways in which that could give rise to further harm, particularly amongst communities that are, um, you know, are homeless and um, and you know otherwise uh, out there on the street, uh, unhoused. So that was definitely something that we saw. Is there anything else from facilitators and note takers that you might want to add to these challenges? Uh, this is Courtney. I stepped out for a minute, so I'm not sure if you addressed the data issues at all, but. That came up a lot, like seeing what can be done with COVID data and seeing what has never been done on HCV data and which hasn't been done as well on HIV and probably should be done more on STDs. Like, yeah, a, so eye that was identified and definitely as a priority. So we'll get to that shortly. Thank you, Courtney. Hey, Ayako. Yes. Um, one of the things that was mentioned is um, California has a pretty significant um, population of incarcerated people. And here is an, a population that um, while there's a lot of opportunity to suppress some of these epidemics in there, what happens post-incarceration and in this great movement of, <clears throat> of reducing population jail, uh, jail sizes, 
um, and in doing reentry efforts, how do we make sure that we're getting the right um, testing and linkage to care to this population at every single point in that process? I wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I'm going to shift over to priorities because that was definitely one of the priorities that we saw uh, across a couple of groups. So um, I'll start there, Robert, because you just started us off so nicely, but just talking about these opportunities to do hepatitis C testing and treatment in jails, and particularly what is the plan for linkages and keeping people connected to care um, as they perhaps um, even go into jail. Um, looking at Medi-Cal rules and the ways in which people lose Medi-Cal coverage when they do go, when they are incarcerated, um, to, to looking at overdose prevention services, interventions that can be done before people are released or right at the point of release. So that was definitely one of the key um, priorities that was noted across a couple of different groups. Um, I think that, um, again, in terms of priorities, this, this notion of bundling testing, I'll, I'll bring it up again, just because there was so much energy behind it, but the idea that you, know, you, you do not have to work in silos, that there's a way in which you can figure out how do you do um, more, more testing um, and how do you test uh, uh, you know, across these conditions um, in alternative ways, right? So um, one of the things I wanna point out is that there was definitely this sense that like, there, there are some shortage in, in um, STI te home testing opportunities, but also that um, HCV home testing is still an area where there's great um, room for improvement. Um, and so understanding better how, how does that kind of bundling or how, you know, how doing that testing all together and offering um, these testing opportunities to people in places that are not um, brick and mortar that, that uh, currently can't even operate for the most part, um, how that can happen. In terms of opportunities, um, I'll, I'll get to the data point that Courtney, you raised. You know, there, there were multiple groups that talked about the need for timely access to data, that there's a need to under, understand how these conditions intertwine. So one, one group talked about, you know, what do we know about COVID and HIV? Do we have any data? What do we know about sexual orientation, gender identity? to what extent are sexual and gender minorities being impacted by all these conditions and COVID, right? Um, and of course, this, this need for, for understanding sort of where, where are we with regard to uh, at collecting and sharing, disseminating um, data on, on hepatitis C testing and treatment. Um, this is this is something that was really noted as sort of a, a gap um, from, from the perspective of folks that were participating in the groups. Um, in, re in regards to harm reduction, I just want to note that um, one of the interesting, um, you know, developments recently is the push for decriminalization um, of substance use. And so it's really important to note that, you know, one of the priorities that were that were, was raised in, in the groups was the um, the idea that, you know, we could we could also look at prioritizing de decriminalization as a way of, um, you know, creating pathways uh, for folks um, using harm reduction strategies. Um, in regards to harm reduction, again, there was a really clear call for more training that people across you know, the health sector are not trained in how to provide services um, using harm reduction strategies and that there's still such a uh, incredible stigma as it relates to people who use drugs. So this is something that was, that was definitely raised. Finally, as it relates to uh, sexually transmitted infections, you know, again, the call for testing, at-home testing, um, you know, the fact that um, testing rates are low is not an indication that people are not having sex. In fact, it's the it's an indication that people perhaps are not getting access to um, to testing in the same way, right? Because of these reductions in services and the redeployment of of staff. So um, those were some of the priorities. Um, that I saw coming out across groups. Um, if there are any other uh, priorities that um, I didn't lift up today, uh, any facilitators or note takers, I see participants also raising them up in the chat. Thank you so much, that's really helpful. Um, but if there's anything else that we've missed, please please feel free to chime in at this time. Hey, Akko. Um, yeah, actually our group spent the entire time on talk, well, was mostly encompassed by talking about the absolute need to further this syndemic process that we've all been engaging in and also to add overdose prevention as one of the components of this syndemic. 
Um, we talked a lot about how silos continue to cause major problems um, between getting people tested and, and, and screened for all conditions, but also in trying to link people to care and to treatment. Um, also, in terms of our messaging, our messaging is not moving fast enough to actually address what's happening in the communities, particularly um, amongst people who are using drugs. Um, we're just not getting the, the right kind of information based on the actual underlying pattern of, of drug use. So there was a really, really strong commitment to um, looking at this endemic approach, not only through combining the, you know, working on interrelated diseases, but also funding. The funding is still so siloed, both at the federal level and, and because of that at the state level. And so looking at ways in which we could better um, leverage funding, staffing opportunities if we can break out of some of these silos. Thank you. And that's really helpful. Um, there was something that came out that I, I neglected to mention that kind of connects that, which is, you know, the, the information sharing that is not happening, that could be happening, right? So, and when you talk about linkages, you know, one of the one of the groups talked about, well, we don't even know what programs are available and open. We don't even know where to connect people at this stage. Is there any way for us to know, you know, when and where, where we can send folks, you know, should the need arise? So that information sharing is also a key component of, you know, breaking down these silos. Um, we are at time. Uh, I hate to bring this wonderful overview to an end, um, but I have a request for you and um, and our and our uh, closing duo coming up will will also remind you again. But we have a poll at the end of the event. Um, it really is just to uh, be able to evaluate, you know, how we did today and whether this was a use a good use of your time. Um, we appreciate your energy and your contribution today. Um, as a quick thank you for anyone that completes the evaluation poll at the end, um, stick your email in the chat. We're going to enter you in a raffle for a wonderful Ending the Epidemics t-shirt. Um, some of you have seen this, but it. Uh, and the front says empowered women empower women so uh if that sort of uh perks your ears a little bit um stay with us complete the poll uh share your email with us in the chat and uh, we'd love to we'd love to get you a t-shirt if possible um so i'm gonna go ahead and uh segue over to our closing team yeah thank you ayako that was um not easy to summarize eight breakout groups in real time, but I thought you did a great job, so thank you. Um, so we are nearing the end of the meeting. Just wanted to, on behalf of CHPRC and ETE, just wanted to thank everyone for joining. Uh, I think as all of us discussed in our breakout groups, everyone is being pulled in a million directions right now. So thank you for giving us two hours of your day. And I know my breakout group was extremely informative and I'm sure the others were as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing the notes. We will be compiling a meeting summary uh, that we'll share with all of you. And then we'll share with kind of key stakeholders. So state and local public health officials, uh, advocates and the broader community. Um, and then we'll share the slides and the re meeting recording as well. So Dr. Burns is on, correct? Yeah. Um, Dr. Burns is going to close us out today um, with a great, uh, I believe she's doing a spoken word before we end. So I want to turn it over to her. Just remember to stay on and complete the meeting evaluation before you leave and enter the raffle for a t-shirt as well. So thanks again, and I'll uh, pass it off to you, Dr. Burns. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks again to each of you all. Once again, this would not be possible if it were not for the participation of everyone, if it was not for the networks that we connect with on a daily basis. And so realize and remember something that we shared in the group too. My life didn't stop because COVID-19 started. It is continuing on. COVID is real. Sex is real. Sex is enjoyable. We just need to be safe while we do it. So these are just reality conversations that we need to have consistently and we need to just be very transparent with it. So as we've been talking about going through and continue to have a racial justice lens, just wanted to share these words as we transition out um, so that it can just stay with us. COVID-19 often said to be the culprit, the one fueling the increase of health disparities, implicit biases and race-based crimes. When if one is open and honest with themselves, these things were already happening. COVID-19 and the current administration, well, previous administration just highlighted the space and offered additional time. For we know that things can't come out if they weren't already in place. From societal learnings to childhood upbringings, 
We point fingers and often suggest who belongs, who should be recipients, as well as to who is or isn't a disgrace. And when one takes the time to take a closer look, beyond the amount of melanin or identified pronoun, sexual preference, or letters behind a name, please remind me what is the biggest issue we're fighting for, as there are definitely less differences than more things we have of the same. Since when did the color of skin decide if one would acquire HIV, hep C, or an STD? Yet that same color of melanin or color of skin makes me more susceptible to implicit bias or the treatment offered to you versus me. So as we move forward to what happens, where we change, adjust, what we all say we need to do, perhaps the first step is placing our biases to the side and taking a step back to realize and talk about how you would feel if things weren't just happening to me our clients or colleagues, but instead we're happening to you. So just wanted to share that as we close out for people just to think about as we continue on about our day, as we continue in our interactions with others, um, with each other, with our clients, with the community. It's important and it's more important now for us to come together than for us to be apart and in silos. So thank each and every person for coming. Please keep an eye out for what is to come, things that are, are uplining. If you're not a part of the coalition, we definitely invite each and every one of you to join. We have different committees dealing with policy, dealing with community engagement, as well as our racial justice um, group. So once again, thank you to everyone. Have an awesome and blessed day. And we even let you all out five minutes early. So with that being said, I Craig, if you have any further words, otherwise, have a blessed day. Everyone be safe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.